Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Welcome to this episode of Baha'i Blogcast. I am so thrilled to be talking to one of my dear friends and someone who I look up to so much, an extraordinary musician, composer, Baha'i speaker, raconteur, Mr. Tom Price, who is on the old Skype with me all the way down in, what is it, Adelaide? Yep, Adelaide, Australia. How do the, how do the Australians say that? Like, Adelaide. Yeah. Italy. Yeah. Good day, mate. Good day from Adelaide. I have an Australian friend who's from Melbourne, and he always says, "Oh, Melbourne is so great, Melbourne." That's I right. think it's. Um, uh, I just love saying Melbourne uh, like the Australians say, or kind of mocking the Australians and how they say it. What's your connection to Australia? You were you're from Tennessee. I'm well, originally from Los Angeles, and then I moved to Australia for 17 years. Most of my family is here. Then I moved back to the U.S. for 24 years, and then I was traveling uh, on a speaking tour, and I met someone who I ended up marrying, and so I've stayed down here. I now have a new wife in South Australia and a 10-year-old stepson. Oh, fantastic. That's great. So love brought you back to Australia. Uh, Well, actually, it only brought me back to Australia for eight days, but it's turned into two years now. Oh, fantastic. And Tom, you have a fascinating story about how you became a Baha'i. And, I, you know, I only have you for an hour or so, but is there any way you could give us the short version of that? It's, uh, I've, heard, I've heard you give that talk before, and it's, it's absolutely uh, scintillating. Wow. How I became a Baha'i. Oh, I, there's, I, that rich, there's that rich and complex family history of yours in Sri Lanka and uh, all kinds of... Uh, exciting and horrible events that led to your kind of spiritual yeah. transformation. I guess it all begins with Carol Lombard. You know, Carol Lombard uh, uh, was a Baha'i. She was married to Clark Gable, and at one time she was the highest paid actress in Hollywood and quite a beloved person because she had such a beautiful character. She and her mother were both Baha'is. And uh, uh, when she passed away... Uh, the whole Hollywood community was devastated, and her costume designer, Gwen Wakeling, who you also probably know is probably the second greatest costume designer in Hollywood, was so depressed at her death, and when she read the, the notice in the Hollywood Reporter, it said, Gwen Wakeling, dead at 33, I have made death a messenger of joy to thee. It was a quotation from her funeral, her Baha'i funeral. And Gwen was so interested in this that uh, she looked up the source of the quotation and soon became a Baha'i thereafter. So Carol Lombard had taught Gwen Wakeling the faith from the grave. And then Gwen Wakeling, because my father was in the film business and he directed and uh, he actually uh, produced films, first acted, uh, when he was overseas, Gwen Wakeling befriended my mother, who was very young, taught her the faith, and she became a Baha'i. So I kind of consider myself a spiritual grandchild to Carol Lombard. But I didn't know much about the faith uh, until my father took me to Sri Lanka, uh, where he was making a film in 1971, and a revolution broke out, a war, a a very bad war. So my family left, except for me and my father, and they went to Australia on a stopover uh, back to U.S., And during that time, I ended up, me and my father both ended up being thrown into prison. This was during the Vietnam War, when everybody hated America in the uh, Southeast Asian region. And I was... Where where were you thrown into prison? In Australia? In Colombo. In Colombo, Sri Lanka, which... Oh, okay. In those days, was called Ceylon. And my mother, uh, my father was making a film there, and my mother had left the country with my little brothers and sisters and grandmother and so just me and my father ended up in prison and uh, I was kept for three weeks in prison at the age of 15 and I was interrogated every day for about you know eight nine ten hours Um, finally they released me Uh, I never got to see my father because we were both being interrogated and they didn't want 
you know, when they interrogate people, they don't want them to uh, have collusion. Share stories. So then yeah. I, uh, I flew back to Australia, and we waited in Australia for eight more months. They said they would release my father. Finally, after um, eight months, the U.S. Embassy said that the government of Ceylon had dumped the dead body of my father on their doorstep, and that was the end of my father. Um, and so we had wow. been waiting eight months in Australia. And during that eight-month period, um, I, I found myself in Australia with no... Uh, I couldn't go back to the U.S. I wanted to go to USC and study law. And uh, I had no father. I, the, the, all the money was tied up in the film. Our, my life was totally turned upside down. And during that time... My mother introduced me to the Baha'i community in Sydney, and very soon thereafter, I became a Baha'i. And for the next 17 years, I stayed in Australia. The only problem was I couldn't get into law school in Australia, but I was very good in music, and so I got into Sydney University in music and ended up becoming a professional musician and a Baha'i. That's a fan absolutely fantastic story, and I, uh, I don't mean to demean or belittle it in any way, but if they make Tom Price the movie, I would love to play you. Well, it's, there's, it's a lot more complicated than that because... Yeah, that was the nutshell version, I'm sure. But after my father died, there were reports in the London press that my father was never uh, actually making films, that he was actually a spy for the CIA, and that he went, would, would go to these countries... Uh, under the cover of making films because they were hot spots. And this uh, uh, immediately resonated with our family because I had earlier been taken to Egypt uh, uh, during the 1967 war with Israel. And uh, earlier than that, my father had also been to several other countries where there were wars when he made films. And to this day, we still can't you know, get enough uh, information out of the U.S. government but we did find recently, only about two or three weeks ago, that my father was actually enlisted in the OSS during the World War II. That means that he was in the spy service of the United States. So it's a very complicated story, and we're still trying wow. to sort it out. That's absolutely amazing. Your dad may have been a real-life spy filmmaker, like in that movie, uh, was it Argo? Is that what it's called? Yes, uh, there have been many writers that actually say that Argo may have been based on, on my father or the idea of my father, because that was exactly the uh, allegation made in the London newspapers, that that's what my father did. Did the he actually make films? Did, were the, films produced in, in Egypt or in Sri that, Lanka? That's the problem. He went to India... Uh, when there was uh, uh, wars going on, he, went, he was in Spain earlier with um, Samuel Bronston. You know, during uh, wartime, he was in Egypt during the '67, you know, uh, Six Day War, and he was in Sri Lanka during a war at a time when you know communism was really feared in Southeast Asia because of the domino principle. And every time he went to these countries, by the way, he took me on the last two trips. I went to both Egypt and Sri Lanka, and he spent a lot of time working with government and, you know, ostensibly to set up films, um, uh, but no film was ever made in the, in the last 10 years of his life, but he spent, you know, enormous amounts of time and energy and money uh, taking whole crews over there, so it was a very uh, plausible front if it was a front, but of course, until... He died when I was 15 years old. I always thought he was a filmmaker. Obviously, he wouldn't tell his children what he was really doing. Uh, so now we are petitioning the U.S. government and writing to various organizations to see if we can get his files released. If so, the story is already remarkable as it is, but it would just add another layer of, of mystery to the whole thing. That's absolutely incredible. And was he a Baha'i? No. Uh, he, uh, my mother became a Baha'i when he and I were in Egypt during the war in Israel. Uh, oh, gotcha. In, in Egypt. Okay. She became a Baha'i, and the only reason she did become a Baha'i is because Gwen Wakeling, who was a Baha'i, befriended her because she was alone, because her husband was away. She befriended her. We came back, and I didn't even know much about the Baha'i faith when we came back, but, you know, gradually I heard that my mother had joined some strange, weird religion kind of thing. Did you have any kind of mystical experience, or what drew you to the faith when you were a teenager in Australia and getting to know the Sydney Baha'i community? 
You know, uh, in those days, 1971, um, a lot of the Baha'i youth were kind of hippies. They had long hair and wore sandals, and everybody played guitar and sang and things of that nature. And I had just come out of prison in Sri Lanka, um, and I had no friends. And my mother took me to Baha'i meetings, and the youth in Australia had, I don't know, every two or three times a week they would get together and play guitars and sing, and they were just so happy. And there was nothing more to it than that at first, you know, just that I really, you know, loved them and, and had so much fun and I got caught up in it. And of course, uh, later on, I started to travel to Papua New Guinea every year and do service projects for three months in which I would w walk into the highlands of New Guinea, where there were, even in those days, you know, many thousands of Baha'is that were living in the most primitive conditions in the highlands. And I really gained an appreciation for how the Baha'i faith could change populations. The, the, uh, the highlands of Papua New Guinea, they were cannibals, you know, some of the regions we went to, and considered the most primitive on the face of the earth. And yet they were so deeply spiritual, and I think that greatly touched me. And so from about the age of 17, 18, 19, 20, in those years, I spent a lot of time doing Baha'i service projects in New Guinea. And then, wow. of course, later on, I got asked to do a lot of music for Baha'i temples. I ended up uh, doing music for the Samoan Baha'i temple dedication in 1984, the Indian temple dedication in 1986, and I worked with Ravi Shankar on the music of that. Then in 1992, I was asked to do the music for the Baha'i World Congress in New York. I don't think that I do anything um, for the Baha'i faith except in relation to art and music and drama, and even when I give talks, I kind of use the same approach. And I guess it comes from my film background. Or my father and my uncle and my great uncle, they were all actors and directors. And segueing to music, since, since you went there, um, I first became familiar with your work with the uh, incredible choral work and orchestrations that you did and composing that you did for the Baha'i World Congress. I was not there. I was not a Baha'i at the time, but I heard it afterwards and was really uh, blown away by your work and Jack Lenz's work. And um, it was an incredible mix of East and West and holy and secular, and it felt modern and it felt ancient. What was your philosophy going into creating that music? Well, you know, the music for the World Congress, it was so easy in a way because we knew that 35,000 people were coming and it would be a great celebration. It was the 100th anniversary of the passing of the founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah. And so uh, there was a program. And the program, you know, had certain needs. And every time you just thought about those needs and meditated on them, and uh, usually the ideas would come to you. And uh, they wanted an oratorio on the first day in which we would basically cover Baha'u'llah's life in about an hour. And so we ended up commissioning a poem to be written, uh, addressed to Baha'u'llah, and six pieces of music that featured all of his life. And so, you know, this is kind of like imagining how the early Christians wrote Christmas carols, you know, to celebrate uh, Christmas or Easter. In other words, uh, th this, this was a very significant event, and I think when you have that inspiration, you know, things do come to you because you have a really exciting uh, new musical experiment that you're undertaking as well. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, what happened was is that several people wrote to me and said, why don't you do some more music like you did for the World Congress? Because that, you know, that had a huge orchestra. We had a 92-piece orchestra and a 400-voice choir. I said, why don't you do some more? And I said, it, it can't be done. It, we had... Everybody, you know, we had uh, unlimited budget, or not unlimited, we had a very large budget, and we had singers from all over the world, and I said we couldn't do it. And so a good friend of mine, uh, his uh, name is Michael Hampton, he said, all you need to do is put it on Kickstarter. And I said, what is that? I didn't even know what Kickstarter was at the time. He said, put it on Kickstarter, and you'll see what happens. So I went ahead and put it on Kickstarter. It took 30 days. That's all, you know, these campaigns are. And within those 30 days, over 700 people uh, contributed money to it, which raised $150,000. And more than 450 people signed up to sing in the choir in a way that is very exciting. It means that they can record their voice in their own home and then 
the recording is just sent electronically and mixed in, even with a video of them singing. If you look on the internet, you can see this has been done a lot recently by Eric Whitaker and others. And so we we have launched that project, and right now we're composing the music. I have various composers working on it. I've just received a piece of music today that's spectacular from Graham Major, and uh, I'm writing some music. And uh, uh, in September, we'll start recording, and by the end of uh, December, we'll have an entirely new CD, all new music, all with symphony orchestra, all with choir, set to the Baha'i writings or the Baha'i teachings. And who are some of the other composers on the album? Well, we've got uh, Sambal Taifi. I'm going to, uh, she's a Persian composer. Graham Major, who uh, has written a lot of pieces that Baha'is are familiar with. Uh, myself, I'm using music by Ravi Shankar, uh, some that has never been released that he composed for the Indian Temple Dedication. And uh, we're reviewing music now from, oh, maybe 15 or 20 composers who have all sent us music. In fact, if anyone's listening now and they still want to send music, uh, we're still reviewing it. In other words, this will be the best new music possible. And also Red Grammar has written a piece for uh, oh, uh, that, this, that's... and it's going to be sung by him with him in a choir. It's a beautiful piece of music that he composed. Van Gilmer has also written a piece uh, that will be sung. And I may consult with my daughter, Rachel, Rachel Price, you know, singer with Lake Street Dive. She yep. may write something for it, too, if she has time. Oh, wonderful. Oh, that sounds, that sounds really exciting. So it's, it really is a worldwide endeavor. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, I think we'll have singers from all over the world, from dozens and dozens of countries on this. And if people are interested in finding out more about... Uh, this project, is there, a, is there a website or a place they can go on, online? Yeah, yes, very soon there will be a website in which if they want to join as a singer, uh, they can join up. There's just a tiny small fee that they can pay, $30, and then they can be part of this whole project and sing on it. The website is uh, G-C-A-O-M-I dot com. And if you forget that, it stands for Global Choir and Orchestra Music Initiative. Dot com. Fantastic. So switching gears a little bit, Tom Price, your daughter is Rachel Price of the awesome band combo Lake Street Dive. I'm going to give you your chance to really gush about the success of your daughter because that band has really taken off over the last three or four, four years. Oh, absolutely. And particularly the last year, you know, now they're playing in very large venues all over the world. You know, they've, they've been touring U.S. since the release of their uh, new CD called Side Pony, playing in venues, you know, 3,000 seaters and more, toured Europe, sold out, and now returning to Europe, I think, in November. And uh, no, the, I couldn't be prouder of Rachel. You know, she's been singing since she was, came out of the womb. I think that she sang to the doctor when she popped out, and she's never stopped singing her whole life. Um, and uh, she sang with our Baha'i choirs since she was nine years old. She was touring. I think she did 17 tours of the world with the Voices of Baha, uh, and now she's just a trooper, just you know, singing everywhere. No, I believe that you're going to hear more from them in, in the future because they write their own music, they sing it, and uh, they're considered you know, very original uh, in the way that they, you know, nobody can classify them. They kind of are a neo-soul, neo-funk Neo blues, uh, uh, you know, they've got all kinds of influences, and uh, yeah, people they, really they, respond to them. They really remind me of uh, kind of like Pink Martini. That yeah. it's uh, it's music for everyone. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's got some jazz and blues and soul and rock and hipsters can like them, and uh, and you can listen to it with your grandparents. It's it's a, just a great vibe. It's now funny. you talk, you go, go to ahead. their concerts, and you've got you know young kids. And you've got old people. And, and you, you, it's just amazing, you know, the demographics that they attract. That's fantastic. Now, you taught all your daughters to sing at an early age. What, how did you do that? Did you just have them sing a lot, or did you give them specific vocal lessons? No, we, we, we did everything in our power to train them to sing. They had, they had specific vocal lessons, all three of my girls and we also took them to all kinds of music schools and music teachers and i actually developed a 
a method of teaching, you know, based on my experience with Baha'i choirs. You know, when you work with amateur choirs uh, and you're constantly working with them, you learn all kinds of techniques to get people that are not trained to sing better. And so my three girls were like guinea pigs. You know, I would try out every vocal technique that I would learn. And I believe that, that the, they are the uh, fruits of it. Because even my other daughter, Emily, who's a professional singer, you know, she's in, sings with the Chicago a cappella, which is one of the great a cappella groups in this country. She sings with the Chicago Lyric Opera and all kinds of other things. She has a spectacular voice, too. And, uh, but also, they sang with me in choirs uh, since they were very young. I think, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight years, they were already singing in, in my choirs. And very soon, we were given solos. So, Tom, the way I really got to know you was through your talks. I heard you speak first before I heard any of your recorded talks. I heard we're living here in Los Angeles, and I heard you speak a few times and was really blown away. And your Baha'i talks have become like Internet sensations, and they get passed around. And I send them to people that aren't Baha'is, um, who just love your way of approaching ideas. And you have several central themes that you come back to again and again. Now, how did this start? Were you always just a, a, a good speaker? Did it come easily to you? Is it something you had to work hard at? And how did you get started at becoming uh, a Baha'i speaker? You know, it happened fairly recently, you know, uh, relatively speaking. I was... Uh, a musician and a Baha'i uh, composer and conductor for you know, 20, 25 years, and never was I ever asked to give a speech you know, uh, for the Baha'is, uh, because that wasn't what I did. You know, they considered me to be a musician. You know, why should I speak? But of course, I did have a lot of experience in front of audiences, usually with my back to them, you know, conducting, but still I was comfortable introducing songs or, or, or concert programs in front of stage. But no, I wasn't a Baha'i speaker until, you can look on the internet, I think they start around 2008, 2009, something like that. And that was really just an accident. Um, uh, I was uh, speaking at just a local house, a house of a Baha'i. They have what we call firesides. And someone asked me to speak and I spoke just off the cuff. Um, and then that person happened to be the organizer of a Baha'i summer school in Tennessee, and uh, he was organizing it, and he got a dropout from one of the big speakers. You know, they usually have very fine speakers at those schools. You know, they're former members of the House of Justice or counselors or, or very good speakers. But one of them dropped out at the last minute. He had heard me speak at his house, and he called me, and he said, can you... Uh, uh, speak at the school. And I said, well, I never do that. He says, well, I heard you speak. I think you can do it. So I went to that Tennessee Baha'i school. Um, some of the people uh, showed up and they saw me on the program and they were furious. They said, how can you be on the main program? We paid all this money to come and hear good speakers. Uh, I don't understand. Why are you speaking? You know, because they knew me for 20 years and they said, hey, he can't speak. Um, and oh, what, so, a, what a bunch of jerks. <laughs> that's exactly what some of them said to me. And I, <laughs> I said, well, I don't know. Blame, you know, I mentioned the guy that, that his name was Bill. I said, blame Bill. He asked me to do it. And uh, furthermore, I, uh, the other speaker on, at one of the schools, he was a f former member of the House of Justice, Mr. Uh, Grossman. And in many cases, they were the other speakers I had to speak, you know, immediately after were very well known. Anyway, uh, they also, for some reason at that school, had very good recording facilities. There was a, a guy by the name of Don Davis who recorded them professionally, and they always put them on the Internet. And so I spoke there, I can't remember, two or three or four years in a row, and they ended up being on the Internet, and people just started downloading them. It wasn't you know, anything promoted or, or stuff, but they started downloading, and soon... Uh, there were just literally thousands, in some cases tens of thousands of people. And so then other schools heard me on those talks from the Tennessee school. And uh, I started uh, touring. And so for I think for about four years, for 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, um, I would do about eight to ten summer schools a year. I think I've done maybe 30 or 40 European uh, countries now in the last four or five years. 
And uh, I was on a tour two years ago that took me to Malaysia and Singapore, Australia, New Zealand. And that's when I met my current wife. Uh, I was speaking here in Adelaide, and that's where I met her at uh, one of the schools. So really, this, yeah, in other words, <laughs> this last five years have been very unusual. Um, but it's funny because I told you my life story that I ended up going to Sri Lanka, ended up in jail, becoming a Baha'i, and then becoming a musician. But my early life, in early high school, I had actually wanted to be a lawyer and then become a politician. That was actually my goal in life. And I had decided I was going to study law, but I did a lot of work in my early days on public speaking. I studied public speaking. I was in debate in uh, high school. In fact, I was the youngest debate champion in Santa Monica High School. Uh, even uh, as a sophomore, I was debating the seniors, and I won two gold medals and stuff. So I had done all of that. And then, of course, when I became a Baha'i, I didn't become a lawyer, and let alone a politician, which we can't even do, and didn't do anything about it uh, until accidentally uh, someone asked me to speak once. So I will continue doing that. In fact, I'm going to I have to give more talks uh, during the time, but this year I'm spending most of uh, my work on the music. But I do speak every week here in Adelaide on a course called The Science of Spirituality. And uh, I'm thinking of releasing some of the recordings of those talks. I think there's about 40 or 50 of them uh, that they made over the past year here in Australia. I love that topic. And that was one of the first topics I heard you speak on was the harmony between science and religion, which, as we know, is one of the fundamental Baha'i principles. And you weave stories of science and spirituality together so effortlessly. What drew you to this topic? And what are you exploring in these new 30 or 40 or 50 talks that you've been giving? Well, I stay on the same themes. It's all about spirituality. But I think the Baha'i faith has something to contribute to the world in the way in which we unite science and religion. You know, so many of the uh, scientific community are becoming atheists because they're so disappointed with the uh, dogmatic, you know, uh, rituals and, and, and uh, closed-mindedness of religion. And at the same time, many religions, uh, they're having such conflict with science. And I believe the Baha'i teachings have a completely new perspective that's so enlightening. And of course, we need uh, we need this in the world. So I believe that uh, there is a link between scientific knowledge and scientific discovery and scientific methods and spiritual knowledge and spiritual discovery and spiritual methods. And the two are really one and the same. They, they both are seeking knowledge and understanding and wisdom in two areas. And so I'm just fascinated by it. I guess I always have been a an avid reader of scientific things. And as you know, music is both a science and an art. And so you'll find that many musicians, uh, because of uh, their understanding of sound and acoustics and various other principles, they do have a scientific bent anyway. And so I just found it natural. And it, it just comes from my own interests and my own reading. That's, uh, that's fascinating that you bring that up about musicians being both scientists and artists. I hadn't really thought about that before, but you think about composing a piece of music and uh, all the technical expertise that needs to go into that and to the and harmonies and dissonances and themes and resolutions and, and how they come together and there's repetitions. And, and exactly. When you, look at, when you look at music on a page, it's not that different than looking at scientific formulas in some way. Yes, uh, and mathematics as well. Uh, not too long ago, there was a, a survey done of all physicists, and they, um, uh, they asked all the physicists in the world to vote on who are the 10 greatest physicists of all time, you know, like Einstein and Feynman and, and, and so on. And when the list was published, many musicians pointed out that seven of the 10 of the greatest of all time were professional-level musicians. Wow. You know that Einstein was a very a professional level violin player and, and so on. Even Isaac Newton, his first uh, uh, paper was on music. His, his, wow. Well, yeah, and in other words, we don't realize that music, because it has some kind of uh, mathematical, it's a representation of truth in a, in, a, in a completely different arena in which you see mathematics uh, 
and it just represents truth. Music represents truth in a way uh, that's intangible in some ways, but in other ways is so concrete. Because if you play a piece of music, it touches everybody, and yet we don't know why. And it, I, I believe that there's something there, something deeply spiritual in music. And uh, so, really, when I write a talk, I don't write it any differently to the way I write my music. I use the same me methodology, same approach. And what is that? What is that methodology? <laughs> well, uh, if, Give us your secrets. Well, you know, uh, I don't sit down and type out a talk or even write out a talk. Um, okay. Basically, I just I walk and I meditate and I think. I keep a little voice recorder in my head. And I, I, when any ideas come to me, I speak them. And if I need some information, I just speak a note to myself, you know, check out this information or find this quotation. Or in many cases, I refer to uh, um, something I know, but I need to get, you know, the facts and stuff like that. And quite often, I will just like the, those early talks on science and spirituality that you heard, I basically just walked around a lake for like eight hours and I just spoke into the recorder, came back and then I typed out, you know, the recorder and I gave the talk without any other work. And when I do music, I do the same thing. I like to walk. I always like to walk for some reason. And I sing melodies in my head. And if I have a particular text that I want to set to music, I say the words, but then I purposely do not try to set it to music. And I just walk and I say it over and over again until something comes to me. I also will never... Uh, write a piece of music until I've memorized the text and I can say it. You know, I don't take a, wow. you know, a book and put it on the piano and immediately play chords and to try to sing until such time I've, I've memorized it. I also rarely ever write a talk slowly. I, I generally just think about something over and over again in the shower while walking. And then finally, just the day before speaking, I just open my mouth and speak. But in other ways, I also structure my, my talks musically. So I, I pace it out and I have humor, sure. you know, every five or ten minutes and I have interesting ideas. I always have an analogy. I, I never, in other words, I have, music is, is structured. It has, you know, components uh, and, you, and, and, you, and you have to have pace and timing and so on. And I utilize many uh, music compositional techniques in structuring my talks. There's... So much fascinating about what you just said, but so it sounds almost like jazz. You know, I interviewed Tierney Sutton, and it, there's an improvisational element to what you're doing as well, in which you're you're building these themes and your ideas, and you're researching them, and you really know what you're going for. But when you get there in front of an audience, you're improvising. Um, yeah, I have occasionally tried to speak from notes, and it never went well. And people, mm. I remember even you one time, I was giving a talk from notes and you said put your notes down and <laughs> and you told me to do that uh, and that was the right thing because as soon as I put them down I spoke differently I don't know why it is that I cannot speak from notes I mean I have just rough notes you know like point headings and I have the quotations typed out so I can read but no I I think it's very much like improvisation and also when you speak in front of an audience you can quickly gauge what they're uh, feeling and mm. you can look in their eyes, and if you're saying something that's hitting, you'll keep going. And if it's, if, if it's not hitting, you immediately change to another subject, which is what I like to do. So if, if, if something's not working well, uh, I just go to another subject immediately because I can read the face of the audience. That's fantastic. The, um, the, you, you spoke about walking and being creative while walking, and I, I recently read an article about it, and it was fascinating how... The human brain and psyche is wired for walking. Really? When we walk, there is a dialogue that's happening between the two sides of our brain. And it's very healing. And they're turning more and more to walking as a healing thing for depression. And they think that the increase in depression and suicide and, and mental illness and kind of general alienation that humanity in Western civilization is experiencing is because we walk so much less. Really? We have been walking for 50,000 years, 100,000 years, and then all of a sudden, about literally 50 years ago, we just stopped walking. And it increases creativity. There are 
or studies taught linking walking with weight loss that even though you're not burning that many calories, there's something about the act of walking that really triggers your metabolism in a positive way, and it helps heal depression, and it helps stimulate creativity. So uh, I think you're onto something there. And, you know, I don't know why it is I do that. I have heard occasionally other creative people uh, have also found that they get ideas while walking. There's only two places I ever hear music uh, or hear ideas. One is while walking, and the other is while taking a shower. Those are the only two times, <laughs> and I don't know why it is, but uh, definitely walking is the way to go. And so if, sometimes I'll research something for a couple of hours, and I consider that kind of like preparing all the ingredients you know, of, of a recipe, and then I consider walking to be like baking it or, or cooking it or incubating it in such a way. So I just I listen to all the ideas, I read books, I read subjects, and then I just get up and walk. And when mm. I do walk, I, I don't force anything. I really just walk. And I try to do it like on the beach or in forests, you know, like nature and things like that. Um, and just generally speaking, it, the breathing and the rhythm and the, something comes to me. And then I just put up my recorder and I speak it in. I turn it off. The interesting thing is it might be a day or two later, I'll turn that recording on. And sometimes I'll hear ideas that I don't even remember saying. I mean, wow. I, I swear, I say, oh, that's a really good idea. I, I, I think I'm listening to a different person, you know. So I don't know where it comes from, but for me, that's what I do. Well, there is a tradition in, in, in Buddhism to, of a walking meditation. And uh, also think about uh, the stories of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha uh, revealing and uh, dictating uh, their revelation or, or, or their letters, and they're always pacing. They're always described as pacing. Yes, yes, I, I know and, this. Uh, and I've noticed some good speakers, they often do pace back and forth. I remember Steve Jobs used to do that with, once he had that kind of uh, headphone microphone. He would go back and forth on the stage. Mm. And uh, uh, so a doctor told me recently, he said, never speak while standing still at a podium. Because he said, you, it's not good for your posture, not good for your back and everything. And so I went and bought one of those kind of microphones. And then recently, I saw a video, which I hadn't noticed, of Abdul Baha, you know, the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith in 1912. And he paced back and forth and back and forth during his entire speech. He walked from one side to the other side of, of the area and was constantly uh, walking and, while speaking. I guess I'd seen it before, but I never realized that he does that now. So now I'm going to try and adopt that even when I speak. I haven't done it yet, but if you see some of the TED Talks where they have the headphone microphone and they're not at the podium, they do pace a lot and they speak well. Of course, you know, stand-up comedians and others also do it. So I may even <laughs> expand my, my walking, not just to preparing speeches, but even giving them. But I'm fascinated to hear the uh, the, the information you just told me about how others have found walking to be uh, meditative. Or, or get a treadmill. <laughs> no. <laughs> and where are your talks available online? Do you have a website where you keep uh, a lot of your audio rec recordings? I did once, and then I had to get rid of most of them because uh, they were charging... The, my web uh, said that too much um, uh, traffic... In other words, there were too many people hitting it, and they wanted to charge me like hundreds of dollars a month. So instead, oh. I just let anyone have them, and people post them all over. And so BahaiLibrary.org, I think it is, and two or three others. And of course, uh, several have been posted on Baha'i Blog. Um, and every now and then, people tell me that they found my talks in places that I don't know. So now I just let them go out there. Many people put them on YouTube. Uh, perhaps uh, in the future, uh, I'll have to get a website up. But if the traffic got so large that I had to take it off. And for those who are unfamiliar with your talks, what, do you, what themes are you working on right now? What, well, can you give us a little taste of these, of these 30 or 40 uh, recorded talks that you have? I'm really jonesing to get to them. Well, recently I did a six-week course, which I may uh, allow to, to go out, called Spiritual Leadership. 
and it was it's a course on how we can be more effective as leaders as bosses in businesses or as leaders or even as parents or in other words uh, there are certain principles that are more effective for communicating and leading and motivating other people and they're they're based on spiritual principles and they're based on ideas of love and so on and they have similarities uh to uh to many of the uh, of the great traditions of leadership and qualities but from a Baha'i perspective. And people found this very effective. In fact, many people that went through the course, it finished about three weeks ago, said that they find they're much more effective at communicating, at uh, leading, at uh, teaching, at uh, educating their children, and so on. So I'm very pleased with that course. And of course, a couple of years ago, I expanded a course called The Twelve Signs of Love. uh, And that Mm. was... Uh, very well uh, received. I've been meaning to write it up into a book, and I believe uh, within the next six months, my wife says she's going to help me by taking all my talks and transcribing them, and so I think maybe that will come out as well. But ultimately, um, my main aim is to completely uh, do a, uh, a dictionary of all things in the physical world that represent the spiritual world. In other words, everything uh, symbolizes something. What do mountains symbolize? What do oceans symbolize? What, do, what does everything in the physical world uh, represent? Because I believe that the physical world is a representation of the spiritual world. So I'm doing a complete spiritual dictionary of all spiritual concepts and how they relate to the physical world and then explore those analogies. And that's a book I've started to work on and I'm going to continue uh, working on because I believe that we can learn all kinds of things by closely examining the physical world and and how it represents spiritual truth. Sure, you gave an amazing talk at the Mobini's house on just uh, garden metaphors oh, and yes. the the plethora of different garden metaphors that Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha used in their writings and talks about pruning and seasons and the variety of flowers and trimming hedges and all kinds of uh, great, great ideas. Yes. Well, because the, the garden and plants are constantly used as a symbol for the growth of the spirit, because the human spirit grows. It's, it's, a, it's a living organism uh, that grows and will continue to grow. And so all the principles of growth in this world that we see in, in, in nature, in organic growth, in plants and animals and so on, all of those principles uh, are, are valid throughout all the worlds of God. They're, they're all there. And so it so happens that a garden uh, and the way in which plants grow has tremendous uh, uh, implications for spirituality. And you know that if you look at a rough, wild, you know, if you just leave your front garden to grow, it doesn't look very good out front. But if you if you do certain things and, and, and you tend to it, you can make it so beautiful. And it's the same with human beings, that if we tend to our gardens, then we can grow spiritually. And consequently, if you look in the Baha'i writings, you know, Abdu'l Baha, Baha'u'llah, and Shoghi Effendi, they constantly refer to plants and gardens and trees as a symbol for human growth. And so there's a lot we can learn. If we can study uh, these principles and then apply them, we have new insights. For example, uh, Baha'u'llah says that in the garden of your heart, plant naught but the rose of love. Who who would have thought that your heart is like soil and love is is a plant that can grow in your heart? And uh, it'll take a whole book to cover all of those analogies. That's fantastic. And what I feel like I say that's fantastic too much. That's okay. I need to like this is my first this is my first attempt at podcasting, but I I have never been like an FM DJ. I need to mix up my little interjection. No, you're doing there, not just say that's so cool. That's so awesome. That's so fantastic. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um. So what are how is the garden of your heart these days? And what do you what are you working on spiritually? And what are you struggling with? Well, you know, a garden. Uh, you have to also keep the weeds out. You have to also keep out, 
you know, thistles and uh, brams and thorns. He has all these different things. So you have to constantly keep your soil fresh and you have to water it. And so right now, I think uh, I just have to, you know, keep at trying to keep the garden of my heart pure and try and plant only love in my heart because that's what he says, plant not but the rose of love. So obviously you can put other things in your heart but love. And the only way you can keep love in your heart is to constantly look at people and try and see only good in them and uh, try and praise them and, and try and ignore their bad qualities. And if you do that, uh, then you'll find something will grow inside your heart. But if you look at people in a negative way, if you uh, consider their faults or shortcomings, then that's like a weed that also grows in your heart. And so I think that's really my main thing is that uh, we have to learn to constantly look on everybody as if they're our friend. Even if they're our enemies, we should always look at them as our friend. And in that way, you'll find a rose will grow in your heart, and that rose will be love. A beautiful thought. And what are you reading these days? What Baha'i works are you reading or, or meditating on or pondering? Um, well, right now, I'm restudying all of... Uh, this, there's a book by Abdu'l-Bahá called Some Answered Questions. And fairly recently, maybe about it, six months to a year ago, an entirely new translation came out. And uh, I don't know if, if everyone knows that, but if they do, it's really important to reread that now. So I'm reading that right now and particularly focusing on the scientific subjects, uh, particularly the Baha'i teachings on evolution, uh, the origin of life, um, uh, the existence of God, those, those subjects which are covered in some answered questions. And I believe at some stage I would like to give a talk on the Baha'i teachings on evolution and try and somehow bring unity to the scientific and religious community on this issue. Do you have any gems from that? What, what's popping out for you about the Baha'i teachings on evolution? I just believe that the Baha'is have a completely different perspective um, uh, to Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, uh, and also different to um, mainstream science or, or what we call atheism or humanistic, you know, secular humanism and so on. But basically the belief in Darwin's theory of evolution, which has evolved, it, it's such opposition to, um, to religion. I believe maybe the Baha'i teachings, because of their balanced view and their uh, unique understanding, can maybe unite science and religion in this area. And for those of uh, you that are aware of the whole uh, field of creationism, which is the, you know, the religious belief that, that the earth was created and that Darwinian evolution is not valid, my great-grandfather is considered one of the founders of scientific creationism. He was, of course, one of the founders of, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but George McCready Price, if you look him up on the Internet, was considered one of the great researchers in creationism in the uh, 20th century. Of course, uh, uh, he was a very literal uh, interpreter. He believed the earth was um, you know, created in six days, and you know, the various things from the book of Genesis. But I believe that his spirit is now uh, something I want to bring back because I really believe that science and religion need to unite and someone needs to approach it from a point of view that can be appreciated by all sides. And so I, I really have been reading, I guess for the last two or three weeks now, nonstop I've been reading literature, both pro and con uh, of evolution and then comparing that to the Baha'i writings. And I, I'm not ready to, to do anything, but I, just, I, I, I mull it over for about a year, and then I do something on that, on that subject. I've always admired your willingness to tackle uh, different ideas. I know that you read all the books by the, the new atheist movement, Christopher huh. Hitchens. And, oh, yes, and, yes, yes. Was it, uh, was it Sam Jones? Is it, am I getting the name right? Yeah, and Dawkins. Um, and, yeah, of and, course, yeah, Richard Dawkins. And, yeah. And I always thought that was that was so great that you're uh, a Baha'i speaker um, and spiritually minded and yet really trying to learn from the new atheists and what they have to offer. Well, they first of all, they have a lot to offer in one sense is that they are taking uh, religion to task. Uh, in other mm -hmm. words, uh, religion is something that 
is a founder found founds great civilizations and great culture, but ultimately it does descend into dogmatism and ritualism and closed mindedness. And this is why religion needs to be renewed every thousand years or so. It needs renewal. And so a lot of these new atheists, they really are not so much atheists in the classical sense that they don't believe in God. They're more anti religion. And it's more because they're looking at fundamentalist religion, Islam in particular at the moment, uh, or, or fundamentalist Christianity, and they're saying that's a problem. And so, uh, and I find that some of the things they're saying are exactly the same thing that Baha'u'llah says in, in books like the Kitab Yagan and so on, in which he says that religion also needs to be purified. So I think that I have a lot in common with them. You know, they don't believe in God, but the God they don't believe in, I don't believe in either. And I believe that the Baha'i teachings have a way of perhaps attracting people who have been turned off by fundamentalist religion because we have such a, uh, a, an open-minded approach to science and such a new way of looking at spirituality. I think that's a good place to stop, Tom. It has been fantastic speaking to you, and it has been far too long as you've been all the way down there in Italy. <laughs> and um, I wish you the very best in your new compositions and your new collaborative global music, choir music uh, initiative. And uh, so excited to hear that. And thank you for speaking with me. Oh, my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Let's do it again. I, I'm an avid fan of Baha'i Blog. I, I read the articles, and, and of course, uh, I've been very happy that they've been able to post some of my talks in the past, so I'm delighted to do anything for a Baha'i blog anytime. Great, Tom. Well, we will, uh, we will take you up on that. Okay. All right. All right thanks. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much. And good night.